Welcome back to Today in Atlanta Sports. Alex, we had an absolute nuke dropped on us. We did a video yesterday, but some more details will come out. So that's obviously what we're going to start off with. Calvin Ridley suspended the whole 2022 season for gambling on NFL games. What's next here for the Falcons? Uh, is, is he going to come back? You know, his, his salary is now pushed back to 2023, but it is non-guaranteed, I read. So I have to imagine, you know, with it being non-guaranteed that the, the Falcons move on. Um, maybe they don't. Maybe they believe in second chances. We've seen them give second chances to other people, but I have a hard time believing that he bet on Falcons games uh, with everything that's gone on, you know, taking a mental health break that, they, that he has, that he plays another down in a Falcons uniform. Yeah, I'd expect them to release him at their earliest convenience. Um, but then again, we don't know much about this regime and how they want to deal with things like this. Um, I will say it, his trade value is tanked. Even in 2023, it's not going to be even close to what they were going to get uh, this offseason if a trade was going to go through. Um He's still a good player. Like when he gets onto the field, and eleven million dollars for Calvin Ridley isn't, you know, a bad deal by any means. In fact, it's a bargain, uh, you know, if he is on the field. Uh, so it's hard to kind of weigh all this. Uh, I would expect the Falcons to release him, but again, we have no. There's no precedent for something like this in general, especially for you know a brand new regime. Uh, so it's hard to base anything off of this kind of stuff. Uh, the, you know, it, it's impossible to know what they're thinking in my gut. They release them, but I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, you know, the whole second chance stuff, uh, you know, they, they didn't take calls on him, trade talks on him because, uh, they wanted to operate in good faith, uh, with other teams around the league, which, you know, fuck that to me, uh, who, who cares about making friends in this league. Yeah, uh, but I, I don't think it would have mattered. He's not – they wouldn't have – the, no way the NFL would have let that trade go through without, like, you know, letting well, the other I was, team know. I, I was curious to see how that would uh, work out because if there's provisions built into contracts, obviously, you know, they have to pass their own team's physicals uh, and all that kind of stuff. So there was probably provisions in this in, in any trade built in about, you know, investigations, whatever it might be. Uh, but the Falcons are in as lost of a state. They're in limbo. They have, I mean, this franchise is unserious, uh, and it, it, it's unfortunate because it's not their doing, uh, you know, so this stuff isn't their fault. Um, but I will well, say this- the time I've spent thinking about it, the more I think he went to Alabama and, more than anything, SEC these Power Five schools tell freshmen the moment they step on campus what they can and can't do in terms of accepting money, betting on games, and then when you get drafted by the NFL, they go through this whole um, procedure again of telling you what you can and can't do, uh, and they explicitly tell you uh, that you cannot bet on games. Uh, so you know, I've had time to you know think it over and. I would release Ridley because, I mean, how are you that naive to think either you wouldn't get caught or you didn't use your deductive reasoning skills to know that that was a bad decision? Uh, Either way, uh, you're unreliable uh, and, you know, you can't be trusted on uh, off the field. And that's a huge part uh, of this regime. They want accountability. And clearly he's still not taking accountability for it. He said he did it, but he he feels no remorse whatsoever. I don't think he understands the gravity of the situation. This was a, uh, one year suspension for 2022, but that's not it that they haven't said it's going to be just one year. Uh, he can apply for reinstatement, uh, a year from next week. Um, and they could really want to make an example out of this as, you know, the NFL gets in bed with all these gambling companies. Uh, they want to set a precedent that, you know, whatever you think you can get away with, you can't. And there will be extensive punishments handed down by the league if you do get caught. So people saying that, you know, he'll be back in 2023, that's assuming because he might not be. Yeah, Um yeah, I want to believe this was like a naive mistake, but 
I think you'd have to be just an absolute dumbass or have earplugs in the entire time that everyone has ever talked to you uh, in college and the professional level. Uh, I have a hard time believing this is the first time. Uh, I mean, most people that get caught never get caught their first time. Um, I will say it's hilarious that he used his own name in a betting app in Florida thinking he wouldn't get caught. I mean, that's got to be one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. So the whole scenario is, is very, very dumb, stupid decisions. But I have a hard time believing he wasn't aware that it wasn't illegal. I just think for some reason he thought he was going to get away with it or no one would notice. And uh, I, I, that's incredibly stupid. But, you know, this whole situation is, is, is very stupid. And, I mean, you hope for his sake it's not really a gambling problem. Um, it doesn't seem like it is, but that doesn't mean there isn't a problem here. And, and there, there's something going on with Calvin Ridley. And I, I, I've kind of been, I've been pretty outspoken saying I thought the whole mental health thing was bullshit, but I'm almost like backtracking here and thinking there could be something here because this whole thing has just got, gotten wild. Uh, the way he's reacted to it, it, it's very Antonio Brownish. I called it that yesterday. It reminds me a lot of Antonio Brown. It's like, what is this guy thinking? You know, where, where is he in his life? You know, I, I hope there's people around him that can talk to him and say, Hey man, like this isn't no fucking joke. Like you didn't just lose out on $11 million. You lost out on $111 million because he was in line for that Chris Godwin, like, you know, $80 million extension, you know, the, that, that, that not necessarily the Julio Jones, like a hundred and whatever million, but you know, he was in line for that, you know, next level, that $80 million extension coming off a second team all pro. So not only do you lose the 11 mil, you use the opportunity at, at getting extension after this year and, and the Falcons will inevitably re release him. He'll probably go play on a, on a, on a small contract. I mean, someone will pick him up when he's done. He'll get another opportunity, but it'll be, you know, maybe a, a, a two, three, five million dollar deal, which is nothing to scoff at. But, you know, when you're talking about a hundred and you're talking about five, and he's got to prove himself again. I mean, he's going to be out of the league for two years, if if not longer, as you've said. And you got to hope he doesn't get injured or, or anything like that. So, you know, the NFL is an opportunity for these athletes to make a lot of money in a very short period of time. And, and there's no guarantees. It's a cutthroat league, um, especially at skill positions. And, and you can get, fall out of favor really fast. And, and so blowing an opportunity like this for Calvin Ridley you can just see the immaturity in the way he responded it, that he doesn't even realize how big of an opportunity he's blown. And I know he has confidence in himself and coming back, but he's going to be, you know, just, I think 29, maybe when he comes back. There, if he not, comes, if he comes back in 2023. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's like no one signing a 29 year old with such a back history of that to a mega contract, like he'll have to perform ex extraordinarily in his comeback season, if he comes back at 29 years old and then be wanting a contract at, you know, 29, 30, whatever he is, no one's given him a, a fat contract. Maybe he's lucky and gets three years, 40 mil. But, he, I mean, he's legitimately lost. Uh, it, let's just add on to the $1,500 he said he bet. Let's assume he lost those eight-leg parlays. Hopefully he hit them. Maybe first that's all, why he's not worried. First maybe of all, it's a safe assumption he didn't hit an eight-leg parlay. <laughs> maybe, he, maybe he hit them, and that's how they found out it was Calvin Ridley, because otherwise they wouldn't have been interested in his name. And maybe that's why he's not worried about losing out on 11 mil. He's like, homie, I just I just cashed out from the hard rock. Uh, but, I mean, all jokes aside, I mean, losing that 1500 bucks, losing the 11 mil this year, and losing another probably 80-plus mil in his next contract extension, I mean – He's lost probably a hundred million dollars in, in, in any future. I mean, it's a it's a very sad story, and I don't think he understands, you know, how how big of a deal in that remark is. I mean, he he had generational wealth lined up for him, and now when he gets out of football, he's not going to have enough money to live on. I know people think five million dollars a lot. That's not lasting your whole life, especially the way you know, you, especially when you've gotten used to living off you know eight ten million dollars. So. $5 million isn't going to last you your whole life. I mean, he's going to have to find another job. It really is a sad story uh, if he doesn't bounce back and make a good amount of money later in his career. Yeah, uh, you talked about the financial ramifications of his decisions, but, uh, you know, there's on-field uh, ramifications for when, if and when he does come back, uh, whether it be for the Falcons or any other team uh, in this league. Every fan, every referee, every coach, every member of 
any organization he joins is always going to have that thought in the back of their head, whether it's, you know, true or not is whether, you know, he doesn't run a route hard. Is, is he tanking? He sits out a game because of injury that, you know, does he owe somebody money or something ridiculous like that? Like that's just how people think. And, you know, whether it's right or not, it's not right, but people have the right to think that, you know, Oh, well, if he would do this here, why wouldn't he do it again here? So not only is he losing out on all that money, but, you know, when I think he'll, you know, be back in this league eventually, um, when he comes back, people are going to be second guessing him at at every turn, every corner, every decision he makes is going to have second guesses. uh, And it's a shame. Unfortunately for us Atlanta fans, Calvin Ridley news wasn't, I mean, it, it was the worst news, but it wasn't the only bad news. And it's because the Hawks, with their in their fifth opportunity to get back to 500 and get to the eighth seed in the Eastern Conference, which is very, very important because it keeps you out of that second play-in game, completely blew it against the lowly Pistons. Now, I will say the Pistons have been playing a little bit better basketball. They've won six of the last eight after last night. But this is just one of those games that, you know, there's such a huge talent gap you have experience. You know you need to win. You know they've been playing better, so you shouldn't be sleeping on them coming in. There's no reason for them to come in here thinking, oh, it's going to be a free win. It's the Pistons. No, they, they've been playing better basketball of late. Everybody knows it. You know, I had guys, if you looked at gambling sites and gambling things, everyone was taking the Pistons plus seven and a half because they've been playing good basketball. So if they all know it, I know Nate McMillan knows it. And something just not getting through to this team, I'm not sure what it is. And it's it's either that or this team's just not that good. Uh, I'm kind of torn below, but I'm I'm not going to say that I was surprised by the result yesterday because anyone that was surprised by the result hasn't been watching all season. This is what they've done. They've beaten very good teams all season. I think that Kevin Keenley, I think that's his name on Twitter, said the Hawks have 15 wins against Eastern Conference, like top six seeds or top eight seeds or something like that. Most in the whole conference. They're under 500. This is what they've done. This is who they are. They don't show up against bad teams. They're lackadaisical defensively. They let bad players or average players look like all-stars. This is who the Hawks are. It's who they've been all season. So I wasn't surprised. That's exactly what I expected. Yeah, I'm not surprised either. Uh, It's disappointing. It feels like, you know, they open up the door and you're like, oh, I can see the light. Maybe, you know, there's a path to the playoffs uh, where they, you know, aren't a ninth or tenth seed. And then they do shit like this. And what I was thinking, it was like when I was watching the game, it felt like it feels like every single time the Hawks play a team that is widely considered worse than them, Pistons, for instance, on the defensive end and maybe in general, uh, they figure out and kind of gauge um, how hard they really need to play. And then they don't play an ounce uh, harder than they absolutely have to. Like on the defensive end, uh, they figure out, you know, just – how hard do I really have to play? Uh, How focused do I really have to be uh, just to get by? And it's fucking bullshit. I I can't believe the inconsistency of this team. And at this point, yeah, they're bad. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This isn't, you know, this this is continuing to happen, Uh, whether it's a personnel issue or a coaching issue. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's not going to get fixed uh, from inside. Uh, Schlink is going to have to do something. Uh, and the worst part about all this is I'm going to keep these same sentiments when the Hawks inevitably get out of the play in tournament with such long odds. Uh, and then, you know, get a first round bounce or something. And they're like, you know, we were there. You know, we turned it on late. It's like, no, uh, you know. There, there's so many different things that aren't working for the Hawks. It's not just the inconsistency on defense. It's the fact that, you know, we're like going away from the pick and roll almost, which is no, absurd. They suck. They suck at the end of games, dude. Like they like that's I agree with you. They play down to opponents and kind of especially with these crappy teams where they can kind of keep them at an arm's length the whole time and keep them, you know, three or four points ahead where they're they're comfortable. They're kind of in a vibe. They're not trying too hard. I agree with that totally. I mean, when you watch it, that's exactly what it looks like. The, the difference is this team at the end of games executes like one of the worst teams in the league. 
So they execute worse than a guy who was run. Kate Cunningham was executing better at the end of the game than Trey Young and, and a bunch of guys who we were talking about being potential all-stars or, or good pieces. Or guys. These guys have experience. They've been in the Eastern Conference Finals, you know, and they don't execute at the end of the game. So on top of them playing down to their opponent and not giving effort, because you're right, these games shouldn't be close. Like they should be up by double digits in these games going into the fourth quarter and, and well into the fourth quarter and 20 points and winning games by 20 and 30 points all the time. They have enough talent to do that. But they play down to their opponent. They expect to be able to turn it on, and they're not good enough to do that. They're not good enough to just say, "Hey, let's turn, it, flip a switch in the fourth quarter and win it." Because if you, are, they are blowing games in the fourth quarter, like just like they did with with Lloyd Pierce last year. Uh, they were blowing games left and right in the fourth quarter. It's the exact same thing. They're playing down to their opponents, and they expect to be able to win at the end of the games, and it's not happening. And and if you keep giving yourself those chances. You know, maybe you'll win a few. The Hawks just happen to have lost a ton, and some of that might be bad breaks, lux, bad calls, but whatever. You shouldn't be in these these positions. If you if you keep giving yourselves the opportunity to lose at the end of the games, you're going to lose some of them. There's too many good players in the NBA that can make plays on one or two possessions. You keep leaving it up to that, you're going to lose a lot of games, and, and that's what they're doing. You know, frankly, the buck stops with Trey Young, um, and his offensive output, you know, astronomically outweighs his defensive liability. Uh, but when you're lackadaisical on the defensive end, you're the leader of the team. You, you, you know, these guys follow you, whether you're a verbal leader or not, they follow you. And when you do shit like that, it gives Deandre Hunter an excuse, uh, bogey an excuse, all these other guys excuses for doing dumb shit. Uh, that's, you know, it's their mental mistakes that it, it's, all effort based. It's not necessarily a talent deficiency. It's it's an effort thing. And I'm not saying Trey Young needs to be LeBron James out there giving rah rah speeches or whatnot. Uh, but the buck stops with you, dude. You're the superstar of this team. Get in these guys' asses. I mean, I, I, yeah. I I'm just it's, I'm dumbfounded. It's, it's, see, I, I see. I'm past the point of dumbfounded. I just I think. This is who they are. Uh, I think they play down to their opponents. I think they think they're better than they are. I think they got a little too a, a cup of taste of victory a little too soon in, in their careers. Uh, I think they they you know see I, I from the outside I was able to look at last year as kind of a fluke. I mean let's be honest these we've said it a million times. Eastern Conference was terrible last year. They were dealing with injuries left and right. Um, you know beating Philadelphia like that's really the only good thing they did, and they barely beat them. You know. They got some breaks to go their way, and they barely beat a 76ers team that, as we've said, they were going to break down anyway. Someone was going to beat their ass the next round. You know, that team was, you know, hanging on by a thread, and, and we saw what happened after they lost. So it's not really what they did last year. While while it's impressive, it's not that impressive. And I think they, they, feel, they feel like they're one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, one of the best teams in the NBA – um, and they can just get by on talent, or at least they have the talent of one of those teams when they're not. You know, they got on having great team chemistry. They, they played as a team last year. They played hard defensively, especially once Nate McMillan took over, and it's like, all oh, that's just gone out the window. I, I know this team doesn't have the talent to be an elite defensive team, but they can be above average. They were top 10 down the, down the stretch last season, and they were even better in the playoffs. So we know they can do it. it it's an effort thing. That's what it always is on the defensive end of the floor. And will can they turn it on down the last 20 games of the season or so? I think there's a good chance maybe they do win 15 out of 20 or, or 14 out of 20 or 13 out of 20. Like, do, do pretty well. But, you know, it's too little too late at this point. They're going to be in the plan tournament regardless. And let's just hope, you know, they don't blow it and, and miss out on the playoffs altogether. I don't think that's going to happen. But they're going to be in the play on a tournament. It's too little too late. And maybe they get in a seven-game series, but – at the end of the day, like we said, they have no chance of winning a championship. It's just disappointing to see this lack of effort on a nightly basis um, from a team that they have no, like, they don't deserve to be showing that little effort. Like, they've done nothing to deserve that. You know, when LeBron James teams came out and they, and they would, like, you know, start the years off 500 through 40 games or, you know, like, even the Lakers now, like, they like if he takes a night off, like he's deserved that. That guy's won four championships. He knows that in a seven game series, like he can dominate you. I feel like the Hawks like feel like they earned something last year. They didn't earn shit. Like you made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. What are your goals? What are what is this team's goals? Like I was I was thinking bigger. 
I was thinking next step. And it's just like they kind of got complacent. I, that's 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 what it feels like. And maybe they'll deny it, but you know, until it, you know, actions speak louder than louder than words. And their actions, it looks like complacency over and over again, night in and night out. Yeah, uh, you said it. Without context, last year's playoff run was wildly impressive. But you had a little context, and it's not. It's not even close to being impressive. I've said it multiple times. The Sixers were on the, were on the cliff. Uh, the Hawks just had good timing and were the, were right there to push them off. But it wasn't gonna if it wasn't the Hawks, it was gonna be the Bucks or the Nets the next round. It was gonna be somebody push that team off the cliff. Um, and they beat a lowly Nets Knicks team, which is a complete dumpster fire right now. Uh, you know this team used to play with a chip on its shoulder. You know do anything to help my team win. I wasn't looking out for my personal stats. And now it's just, you know, some guys got paid and now they're like, oh, I got to live up to my contract. Or guys are still trying to get paid. Um, And they saw, you know, what, you know, DeAndre Hunter saw what Kevin Herter did in the playoffs. He's like, I got to do that. I mean, these guys are just playing, you know, individual basketball, looking out for their own self-interest. And it's disappointing. And, you know, it really, you know, it, it stops with Trey Young, but not really. You know, Nate McMillan needs to get his head out of his ass and tell some of these guys they're not as good as they think they are and to fall in line, you know, do what the team needs you to do. It, 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 it's just, it's like yeah, banging my wonder, head against a wall. You wonder if, because I know we know now, especially since Lloyd Pierce has been fired, he was the big tough love, like hard nose head coach who was, you know, pick, you know, picking on Cam Reddish and, you know, didn't really play favorites, kind of gave Trey a lot of tough love. You kind of wonder if Nate, even though that was kind of who he was as a basketball player, kind of backed off of that from from a coaching style, maybe doesn't want it. But that's certainly what the Hawks need now if they need anything. But I'll I'll say that their season has been disappointing. Nothing's going to change that, even if they win. Unless they win 19 out of their next 20, it's going to be a disappointing season for the Hawks. But you know it'll be 10 times more disappointing if we see Freddie Freeman and Dodger Blue next year. And Max Muncy, who actually was the Dodgers' first baseman last year, commented on it on an L.A. radio show saying, hey, if you insert Freddie Freeman to that to this lineup, we're unstoppable. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> if Freddie Freeman goes to Los Angeles, and, you're, and if you're thinking, oh, how can – the Dodgers work it out. It works out easily. Max Money can play second and third base. He can also DH, which is coming. So Dave Roberts will have endless, you know, options. And, you know, already know the Dodgers have depth. So, hey, maybe he wants to rest Freddie, which is like a luxury only the Dodgers can do. Maybe he wants to rest Max Muncy, who's an MVP candidate. Yeah, a luxury only the Dodgers can do. But if Freddie goes to Los Angeles, you might as well pencil in three out of the next five world series. And I know baseball, not always the most talented team wins. That will be one of, that will probably be the most talented team I have ever seen walk this earth. And Freddie just is a locker room guy. I don't imagine there being any prima donna stuff. That is a world series in the making. So I really want to ask you this because we've talked enough about the Freddie thing. I'm not going to, I just want to ask you one thing about this. What would leaving for Los Angeles to play for the Dodgers do for Freddie Freeman's legacy in Atlanta? I guess it depends on who you ask of, you know, a wide, a wide margin of fans are going to be extremely spiteful. Uh, It'll completely tarnish his legacy. Um, And then there's, you know, the rational fans, which is a very small majority uh, minority um, that'll, you know, appreciate what he did for Atlanta because he did do a lot has done a lot. I mean, he brought a world series here for the first time in uh, 20 years or whatever. So I think it depends who you ask for me personally. And for the wider MLB uh, fan base, it's going to tarnish his legacy. I mean, and that's the big question. If he doesn't give a fuck about that kind of stuff, then he's gone. I I think, Uh, but I guess his decision is really going to be based on how much he truly values being a brave. Like Chipper Jones said, if he wants to be an Atlanta brave, he's going to be an Atlanta brave. So this, this decision is going to reveal quite a lot about how he feels about not only the Braves, but the fans in general. So it's, yeah, I think shaky. 
I think you could pretty much forget about any idea of Freddie Freeman having a legacy in Atlanta if if he does this. Uh, I because I I number one I think you know you're taking you're literally stealing championships from the Braves. I mean, you look at the two best organizations of baseball right now. It's the Braves and it's the Dodgers and it's everybody else, you know, a notch below. And these teams are set up to win for the next, you know, decade. And if you were to take, you know, unless it's like a ridiculous amount of money, which I don't think it's going to be an incredibly like different amount of money for him to go to Los Angeles than it is to stay with Atlanta. But unless it's ridiculous, uh, there's no excuse. I think that would completely tarnish the reputation. And I think the thing is not just tarnish it, destroy it. There would be no legacy. No one would talk about Freddie Freeman in Atlanta 20 years from now. There just wouldn't be in it. And you want to know the biggest reason why is because Atlanta has is loaded with guys to, to be the face of the franchise next. Like as much as we would be pit, as much as like, there would be no like, Oh man, like we suck now. I miss you, Freddie. Thanks for giving us that one championship. No, it would be like, Oh, we still got Ronald Acuna, Austin Riley, Ozzy Albies, all these guys. We're going to trade for a Matt Olson. Maybe we sign a Carlos Gray. We're going to still be loaded, and we're going to be coming for your throat. And those guys are going to be the guys that get remembered, not Freddie Freeman. I, so, because the, the also the thing is, Freddie he had this championship run, and, and he was obviously great. He won an MVP during a shortened season, but it wasn't like I'm not going to say he didn't do anything, but unless he retires in his career a brave he didn't do anything that uh, other braves haven't done really you know he didn't do anything chipper didn't do before him you know he didn't do i mean i don't even think if i'm trying to compare him to another brave I, like he would just be another guy that was on that 95 championship team like uh, almost like a fred mcgriff and fred mcgriff didn't leave us for the dodgers so it's i just do not think i I I would have a hard time believing he has any legacy in Atlanta. I think it would completely tarnish it. So yeah, if if that's something that matters to him, which he said time and time again, um, I, I don't see how you can make that move. But I'm looking at the guys, the biggest suitors for him: Yankees, Dodgers, Mets, and two out of three of those. You, if you go to them, if you go yeah. to New York and play for the Mets, and if you go to the Dodgers. No one in Atlanta is going to say – it's not going to be hugs and kisses. Not when you come back. It's going to be booze. I mean, I there is no way in hell. I don't care what Freddie Freeman's done for this franchise uh, that I sit, stand up and give him a standing ovation when he comes back to the plate in Atlanta if he's wearing a Mets jersey or a Dodgers jersey. I, and I think it, it might be 50-50. I think some people will get nostalgic in that moment. I don't but think regard, it would be 50-50. Regardless though, regardless, though, long term, long term, I, there would be no legacy. I think that's the biggest thing. Long term, it, it, people would forget about what he did, you know, it, just winning a World Series. You know, that's why I think coming off a World Series, people might cheer like, oh, you, you gave us like you get that ring. He's going to have his ring ceremony like he'll probably get some cheers long term, though. Like after that first visit, I, I think that's that's all out the window. Like we'll give you your applause because you did help us win that World Series. But after that and and for the length of his you know life. I don't think there's going to be very many uh, flowers and roses handed out. Yeah, it's a it's a sticky situation. I, I I'm I just got chills imagining uh, me inside True is at the chop house and see Freddie come up in Dodger blue, and they're like for playing first base for. I don't get the... chills. I puke. Like well, that's that what I'm actually, saying. I'm I well, can just imagine well, myself just screaming, just screaming. I wouldn't be. I, I'm as irrational as they come when it, you know, in the moment I would be booing my ass off. I mean, I, I would not stand for something like that. There's such thing as loyalty in this business. And I know, you know, this whole lockout negotiation things are, you know, it's really just pointing the gun at each other in terms of loyalty and everything like that. But this is different. This is like player to a fan base and yeah, they don't owe us anything, but they kind of do. I mean, you know, well, we I mean, supported I mean, them when they're shit. Well, they don't. They don't owe us anything, but we don't owe you anything. Like, I don't fucking owe you a damn thing either. Like, you know, if you stay and you, and you commit to me, I commit to you. But if you if you go, I mean, because it's your choice, you know, it really is, you know, a, a true relationship, you know, player plan, just like a, a girlfriend would be like, maybe I'm not as upset about a player leaving as my girlfriend leaving me, but you know, I'm still pissed off and like, there's going to be animosity there. Like I, I'm not, you know, you chose to leave us and, and that that's how it goes. And I know there's other things that go, go into it, like in contract negotiations. But like I said, I don't think 
the gap and what the Braves are going to offer. And we're going to know if he does go to Dodgers. Like I've said a million times, AA has made it clear. You know, he's very upfront with what he's offered, and no player has ever come back and been like, oh, no, that's a lie. He didn't offer that. So we're going to know what he offered. And I don't think the gap's going to be significant enough where, to where it's going to warrant, you know, him being able to, to escape without fans being like, nah, F you. You're, you're, not, you're not a Brave anymore. You're, you're not a part of the city. The legacy's tarnished. The legacy's not even non-existent. Yeah, uh, there's some irrational Braves fans out there, and uh, it's not going to be can, a pretty sight. I mean, I, you can put you can count me as one of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm I would not be a Freddie fan um, a, at all if he went to Los Angeles, and I would I would be I would make sure to be at every game that he played in Atlanta and boo him and make sure he knows that you know he's not he's not a part of the city anymore. Like. He, what he did for Atlanta, it's in the past, you know. And I also said a million times, I, I don't get too nostalgic. I want to win next year. Like, I'm not – everyone, like, always loves to talk about, like, oh, like, we, we won the World Series. We're still the World Series. Yeah, it's hot. Shit, I don't care. I'm thinking about 2022. Like, get this season going so we can kick ass again. And if you're not a part of that, you're against that. And if you go to our rivals, knowing what it'll mean, because he knows, he knows damn good and well what it means, nah. F that. Yeah. It's well, a sad situation all around. That wraps up this episode. A, a nice, nice long episode. A lot of stuff to talk about. Not a lot of good stuff. Pretty much all bad. Freddie Freeman <laughs> going to Los all Angeles. Bad. Calvin really getting suspended for a year. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, this is the Great Depression of sports in Atlanta right now. Welcome um, to Atlanta, baby. It's kind of wild because, you know, uh, after we won the World Series, Georgia won the national championship. The Hawks went to the Eastern Conference Finals. Like, I feel like we should be talking good about like Georgia sports. And it's like, no, this is the most depressing time I've I've probably had covering. I, I think 2015 Braves, when we won 60 games, I was happier than I am right now. <laughs> and the current state of the MLB lockout and the Falcons and everything. But yeah, that wraps it up for this episode. I'm sure we'll be back more, hopefully, with some better news, but I can't guarantee anything at this point.